The Great Barrier Reef is the largest coral reef ecosystem in the world, covering an area of nearly 350,000 square kilometers, roughly the same area as Japan or Italy. It began its existence half a million years ago. The current reef structure is thought to be around 8,000 years old. In all that time, very little has threatened its survival until the arrival of modern agriculture and industry. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the best protected marine areas in the world, but we are certainly facing some severe challenges at the moment. There's really four main issues that are posing a threat to the Great Barrier Reef today. The first and the greatest is without question climate change. Climate change is a natural phenomenon, but in recent decades, accelerated global warming has occurred, caused by a variety of human activities, especially those that increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A lot of people, I think, think that climate change is an issue for the future, that maybe it will happen in the future. But climate change is right here, right now. Every year we see record-breaking temperatures somewhere in the world, uh, at the beginning of 2016, we saw record-breaking temperatures on the Great Barrier Reef itself from February right through to June. And those record-breaking temperatures, which were mostly caused by climate change, were the cause of the worst coral bleaching event that we've ever seen. Coral bleaching occurs when water temperatures rise and the coloured algae that live in the coral's tissues, giving them their colour, leave the algae. The coral expels the algae revealing the white coral skeleton. But the relationship between the algae and the coral is vital, as the algae supplies 90% of the coral's energy through photosynthesis. As long as summer temperatures are normal, then the relationship is fine. Maybe corals might get a little bit paler, but not a lot, and essentially that food supply from the algae to the coral will stay as it should be. The problem really comes when we get an extreme heat wave during a summer. And at that point, the corals get really stressed, they spit out those algae, they lose their color, and they're starving to death. The obvious connection with climate change is that what we're seeing with climate change is, yes, the long-term average temperature of the Earth is increasing, but the frequency and intensity of intense heat waves is also increasing. That's driving bushfires, as well as coral bleaching events. Another threat from climate change is ocean acidification, the process by which increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolves into the ocean, producing carbonic acid. So literally, as we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're making the oceans get more acidic. That acidity actually interferes with the process by which corals make the skeleton that they form. And that skeleton is critical because that's what makes a coral reef. It's the building block of the coral reef. There are other ways climate change affects the reef as well. There is some evidence that cyclone intensity may go up. That would damage the reef more than the cyclones that we have today. There's also evidence that rainfall variability will increase. Now this means we'll get longer, harsher droughts followed by more intense floods. And it's the big floods that really drive pollution to the reef because they wash a lot of soil and agricultural chemicals off the land and out into the marine environment. So bigger floods would be a problem. Human activity along the coast has had a huge impact on the reef in other ways too. We're particularly concerned about activities in the catchment of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is the land that next, is next to the reef, but where the water from rainfall that hits that land washes pollutants off the land and into the reef. And our biggest problem in that regard is agriculture. The crown of thorn starfish is a natural predator of coral, but fishing and farming have caused an unnatural increase in the starfish population. As long as it's at natural numbers out there on the reef, that's fine. It's just a natural part of the reef ecosystem. The real problem is that humans have interfered with the biology of the starfish. And the main reason we think this is that the fertilizer that we apply to our agricultural land washes off the land, washes out onto the reef. And once it's out there, it has exactly the same effect. It fertilizes plants so that they grow more quickly. Now, in this case, I'm talking about microscopic plants called plankton or phytoplankton, and those are the food of the baby starfish. 
The reef can adapt to normal numbers of starfish, but if numbers rise abnormally high, the starfish consume coral more quickly than it grows. An individual female starfish can produce between 60 million and 100 million eggs in a single year. So even a small change in the percentage that survive really makes a big difference to how many starfish we have out on the reef. Alex Ainsco works for the Association of Marine Park Tour Operators, one of many organisations invested in maintaining and protecting the reef. I'm the dive supervisor on board MV Hero, which is the Crown of Thorns starfish control boat that runs out of Cairns. We do 10 day stints year round, so we work 10 days on and four days off all year. So for that 10 days we're um, in different areas of the Great Barrier Reef and we stay overnight on the vessel for that whole time. A uh, typical day starts at 6.30, that's wake up time for everyone on board. 7.30 is time for a dive briefing, so that's when we sit down and I give a briefing about our activities for the day, um, what our site is like and what our movements are going to be in the water. By 8 o'clock we're on the back deck getting kitted up in our dive gear and heading off in the tender for our first dive of the day. Some days we have amazing weather and um, crystal clear water and other days we have some challenges with weather like um, rain squalls and, and bigger swells um, so that can make our work in the water challenging but um, we get to spend every day diving and snorkeling so uh, for me that's one of the best things about my job is that I get to spend every day in the water. Alex and the other divers have their work cut out for them, just finding the starfish. So Crown of Thorns starfish um, are often very cryptic, which means they hide during the day. When they're fed on coral, they leave behind a bright white feeding scar um, that, where they've digested all the coral tissue and what's left behind is the bright white skeleton. It can be a circle or it can be some, a very distinct white band on branching coral. Uh, and we use those cues um, to start looking in that area for a starfish. So we often um, will see an older scar which has been covered in algae. Um, so we start searching around that, that area and look for brighter, wider, more uh, recent scars. And you'll often find the crown of thorns starfish very close by those fresh scars. And when you see them, they might be tucked away in a rock and you can just see the silhouette of their spines. You're looking for that distinctive colour that they have. They're quite multicoloured. They're come in all sorts of different greens, blues, purples, and they've got large spines on top and anywhere between 14 and 21 arms. They're also jointed, so the starfish can fold their spines down to get into tight areas. The spines are also covered um, with toxins that are um, poisonous to humans if we were to get spiked by those starfish. A large adult is about 40 centimetres, and at that point they sort, they've they sort of reach refuge by size, which means that they're so big that um, there's nothing that's really going to predate them anymore. And you tend to find them after they've reached that larger size, they'll just be out in the, in the open um, feeding during the day as well. This particular starfish could eat uh, an area of coral about 10 to 15 centimetres. So the size of their oral disc, which is this circle here, is what they could digest per day. The divers use a long injection gun to inject the starfish with a solution made from bile salts, a byproduct of cattle farming. The bile salts kill the starfish quickly without harming other life on the reef. Well, they're generally, um, they know something's up and they'll try and um, hide. Um, but after injection, um, it's a single shot injection. And following that, we leave the starfish on the reef and they usually die within 24 hours. Um, and they will decompose and the other fish life will come and eat some of their tissue as well. The control program has been very successful in some areas. When I first started we were collecting lots of large adults off the sites at Fitzroy um, and now when we're revisiting those same sites um, we're often only finding a handful of juveniles. Um, so in terms of success I think that Fitzroy Island is definitely a success story and there's been um, new coral growth um, just in the two and a half years that I've been visiting those sites. There are too many outbreaks of starfish in different areas for boats like MV Hero to control them all. So the program focuses on healthier reefs, 
where there is the greatest chance of having a positive impact. We've worked very carefully with scientists to pick coral reefs that have got a good amount of coral left, lots of capacity to produce baby corals into the future, and reefs that are connected by currents so that the baby corals produced at a given reef will do a great job of reseeding other reefs downstream. While Alex and other divers try to directly control starfish already on the reef, farmers working the nearby coastal land are doing their part to prevent outbreaks. Reef Guardian cane farmers um, are a group of farmers who voluntarily adopted a set of practices to, to best work with their, with their environment. And um, those, those practices developed over a period of time and they are recognised best practice in the industry as a whole. The things that I do on my property here can contribute directly via rows of forces and runoff from our, through our streams into the health of the Great Barrier Reef's lagoon. As well as fertilisers that contribute to Crown of Thorns outbreaks, runoff from coastal farms can also contain harmful chemicals and sediment. Our biggest problem here is the quality of the water that leaves our farm. And if we can make the quality of the water as it leaves our farm gate as high as it possibly can, once it gets into the streams that run into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon, that water doesn't have as detrimental an effect. Water quality in the Great Barrier Reef is absolutely vital to the way corals can actually grow and recover after any event that affects their, their life cycle. Reef guardians like Paul are accredited by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and industry groups like the Cane Growers Organisation in Queensland have adopted many of their changes as best practice. Reef guardianship also has a very strong focus on the economic bottom line of farms because there's a very strong correlation between um, a financially successful farm and an environmentally successful farm. The changes made to farming vary depending on the local geography. Many farmers are making use of modern farming technology. We can fertilise at optimal times um, so that we maximise the amount of fertiliser that is taken up by the plant before there's any potential for it to run off so that they're soil specific and they stay there. Um, we're laser levelling our land now so that we get minimal grades so that runoff is uh, not as violent. Um, careful farm design so that we try to keep the water on our farms as long as we possibly can before we filter it off through natural wetlands wherever we can. We know there's a focus on us uh, from around the world about how we manage the reef. Um, and we feel quite proud when we can do things on farm that actually achieve a beneficial outcome for the reef. The Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators, the Reef Guardians, and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority are among many organisations that are working to secure the future of the reef. There are a huge range of government organisations, institutions, private companies, private individuals throughout the world, all of whom are playing a role in shaping the future of the Great Barrier Reef, particularly through greenhouse gas emissions. There's substantial investment in protecting the reef right here in Australia and to improve its outlook for the future. At the moment, we have assessed the outlook for the reef as poor, and that makes me really sad because it's such a vibrant, beautiful, amazing place. The critical thing for the future of the reef really comes down to climate change, and this is where everyone anywhere in the world can play a part in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing future impacts of climate change, and securing a healthier future for the Great Barrier Reef.